right, more on that historic uh, appointment. SABC News correspondent Sean Bryce Peace uh, now live uh, to us uh, with uh, South Africa's Trade and Industry Minister Ibrahim Patel. Of course, about Dr. Konjo Ewiela's uh, historic appointment as WTO Director General. Sherman. Griselda, thanks very much indeed. And as you correctly point out, I'm in New York, but the minister is in South Africa, Mr. Ibrahim Patel, the minister uh, for the Department of Trade, Industry and Competition, to weigh in on the historic candidacy, now the successful candidacy of uh, Dr. Ngozi Iwiala, or Konjo Iwiala, I beg your pardon, the first woman and the first African to lead the World Trade Organization. Minister, good to see you. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. What's your initial reaction to this historic moment not Africa not only for Africa but certainly for women around the world well thank you very much and good evening shown to you and to all the viewers I think as you've said it's truly historic it's the first time in the global trading system that an African is appointed as the director general and uh, it's the first time that we have a uh, a woman uh, director general and bear in mind that so much of the goods that are traded across nations are made by women. So many enterprises are run by women. And that Africa supplies so much of the raw materials that lubricates the global trading system. For us, uh, so I would like to, uh, to really uh, warmly welcome her appointment. South Africa, of course, was one of the countries that strongly lobbied. And she had the strong backing of the entire continent. Uh, during one of the meetings of the, the African Ministers of Trade that I chaired, we gave her an opportunity to address the trade ministers last year. And she set out a compelling vision of what she saw as, as uh, uh, the goals of her uh, uh, period as Director General, her leadership of the World Trade Organization. Looking at it from an African perspective, the World Trade Organization is at a crossroads. There are so many losers to globalization. Yes, there are winners. Millions of people have been lifted out of poverty. And global trade has helped, together with technological innovation, to change our world in many ways for the better. But globalization has also left behind workers in the South and even in the North who feel that the benefits of global trade has not come to them. So there's time now for a bold new agenda for the World Trade Organization, one founded on a greater development focus that trade must ensure that the benefit of greater human interaction, because that's what it is about, that it reaches many, many more people. Global corporations have been, in many cases, the big winners. We've seen the rise of the billionaire club. Right. But global trade is not designed for that. It's designed so that the farm worker, the factory worker, the person hustling on the streets with a new service, that they too can see the benefit of larger markets, more integrated markets. If and I can so, jump in, Minister, despite, yes, despite the title of Director General, as we have come to understand leadership of multilateral organizations, whether you're talking about the Director General of the World Health Organization or you're talking about the Secretary General of the United Nations, there are limits that come with that responsibility. These are member state driven uh, organizations. So when you talk about a bold new agenda and the need for these developmental reforms, one can't just look to the new Director General as leading them. This has to come from the body, uh, the body that is uh, the member membership of that organization. She is limited, is she not, in what she can really achieve here? Absolutely correct. So there are limits to what a director general can do, but there are also opportunities to what a director general can do. And you've pointed to the limits, and the limits are that this is a member-driven organization, and peculiarly, the World Trade Organization is based on the system of consensus. So even um, a small number of states can hold back agreement uh, where there is uh, widespread support. And so uh, that is the limitation. But the opportunity is there that a director general leads the thinking, uh, enables the right research to be done, for those findings to be disseminated, for problem-solving sessions to be set up between countries to try to, to foster uh, uh, new agreements, uh, to break deadlocks, 
uh, to find the means through the dispute resolution systems to hold countries accountable for the commitments that they've made. So I want to, to recognize the limitations and say she will need the backing of member states. She will need the support from the global south, but she will also need support from the global north. But I also want to highlight the opportunities that being director general does matter. Uh, playing that key role in holding the organization together brings opportunities, and that's what we need to unleash. One of, of the course, big, one of the big talking points heading into her uh, selection, Your Minister, was the, the trade war between the United States and China. The fact that uh, certainly uh, the narrative out there, uh, certainly in media reports, is that China was not being held to account uh, by the multilateral system that is the WTO, the ineffectiveness of its appellate body that didn't have the full composition of the people needed really to effect uh, various decisions. What do you make of that standoff between Washington and Beijing and how it's really been affecting smaller countries like South Africa? Let me start with the micro and then perhaps deal with the, the bigger question, an interesting question that you raise. On the micro level, the dispute settlement system was grinding to a halt precisely because the United States had not um, approved the composition of additional members to the system. So it was a self-manufactured crisis. You don't agree to the new people being put in, and then you criticize it because there are no new people in it. But that's in the micro detail. I think at a macro level, it is clear to us that the trade war between the United States and China uh, it underlies, it, it, it lays bare some of the bigger crises that the World Trade Organization has to deal with. And um, there's a new administration now in the United States. It has said that it wants to embrace a greater level of cooperation and partnership with the rest of the world. Uh, it will uh, no doubt um, want to protect American interests, but it will want to do so smartly. For us, what that opens up is a space to say if workers, blue collar workers in the United States uh, feel that they are the losers in the trade relationship between the United States and China, is it not time for a new deal? A new deal, though, in which development is placed at the center. If each country simply was seeking to lobby actively for, for the interests that it represents, we may never have a rules-based system. And a rules-based system, one in which not power, but agreed rules guide the actions of sovereign nations is important. We saw in the case of the United States, a, a, a strong reliance on uni unilateralism, mm -hmm. on imposing the US imposed on South Africa, quite sharp restrictions on the export of steel and uh, aluminium uh, by South Africa to the United States. Not because our products were dumped, not because we were uh, in contravention of any global uh, rule, but simply because we were competitive and we were able to export uh, more cost effectively to the United States than what the US could produce. Now, given the, the huge challenges on the African continent, Africa's road out of poverty and uh, crisis lies in a strong program of industrialization. Put bluntly, we need more factories, we need more manufacturing on the African continent. And that does require a, an adjustment globally that our, our uh, partners in Europe, in the United States, in China, in India, in Russia, all over the world needs to recognize that the global trading system must give African countries both the policy space in their own countries, but also, very importantly, the opportunity to sell goods elsewhere in the world. Not raw materials, right. not minerals and agricultural products only, but also processed products. Yeah. And that's where there's a huge opportunity with the African continental free trade area. Yes, the process of beneficiation, I think, has been uh, certainly front and center for the South African government now for a number of years. Let me just quote you, Minister, a little bit from the WTO statement, quoting the new di di Director General designate. Dr. Okonjo Iwiala says, the key priority for her work will be 
uh, um, working with members to quickly address the economic and health consequences brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic. From a South African perspective, what's your reading into her role as it comes to uh, the current uh, uh, restrictions that the world is facing as a result of COVID-19? I think it's a pragmatic approach that she's taking, that she has to start with the immediate challenges faced by countries. And I'll give two or three examples. The first example is the, uh, the vaccine uh, supply policies in which uh, enormous stocks of vaccines will be built up in wealthier uh, developed countries. Vaccine uh, nationalism. Current orders, exactly. Uh, and, and that needs to be addressed. It needs to be addressed in partnership and by agreement between all of us. The second uh, 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 related challenge is what the European Union calls strategic autonomy. The recognition in this crisis that there are certain products that each country or each region needs to have available locally. And so that will spur greater efforts on localization, a policy that President Ramaphosa has highlighted in his State of the Nation address uh, last week. The third element of what comes out of this is the pandemic has set back many developing countries by many, many years. The loss of productive capacity caused by disruptions in global supply chains and the closures of borders and of economic activities in order to save lives are real. Wealthier countries have a little bit more space to balance that, to absorb that, they can uh, go into the kitty and help, uh, help uh, manage this period. For many developing countries and for least developed countries, there is no kitty. There is no space to do this. So uh, we would need to have trade policies that actively supports the recovery of those economies that have been hurt, that have been damaged by COVID-19. I see out of that recognition uh, by her, an opportunity for us to link the short-term agenda with a broader rethinking that is required in global trade to do what we said earlier, to place development at the very heart of trade policy. Uh, Minister, just a final question on the, the political dynamics when we talk about the World Trade Organization. Uh, you mentioned the fact that we have a new sheriff in town in the United States. His name is Joe Biden. He replaced uh, former President Donald Trump uh, after winning last November's election, even though that was in some dispute. But it was the United States that blocked the confirmation. The United States as a singular country that managed to hold up the uh, confirmation, despite broad consensus within the WTO, of uh, the, the uh, candidate candidacy of Dr. Ngozi Okonjo Iwiala. What did you make of Washington's posture, uh, even though it has now changed under Joe Biden? And what does that uh, tell us about the power structures within these organizations, given that one country could essentially block the consensus here? One country, but quite a powerful economy. And what it points to is that ultimately governments have to look after the interests of their constituents. And what we saw over a number of years is that uh, the United States benefited from global trade and from the rules-based system. But as other countries began to understand the rules, adjust to the rules, build up their productive capacities, there was more competitive pressures in markets uh, uh, inside the United States. And you saw the rise of discontent. Uh, Blue-collar workers were profoundly unhappy with what they saw as the raw deal that they got. That history we can relate to because in many developing countries, there are workers who have not seen the benefits of uh, global economic integration. And so as we reform the World Trade Organization, it's about finding a better balance, a balance in which countries recognize the value of trade. We don't want to go back to an autarctic uh, a point where each country seeks to do everything for itself. But we also recognize that countries must deal with the immediate development challenges of unemployment, of bringing young people into jobs, of empowering women, not just um, in uh, positions uh, uh, in politics and in society, but also as drivers of firms and enterprises that make things, that grow things, that dig things. And world trade provides that opportunity. I want to leave you with a, a final number. Africa represents 17% of the world's population, but only 3%
of the world's trade and only 1% of the world's steel production. Those numbers are telling. And for us, the opportunity of a director general who is experienced because she was also the finance minister of um, Nigeria, who's experienced the challenges of the African continent is to open up the space together with member states for Africa's industrialization. That's what we're looking to, to, to achieve in the period ahead. And a great way to leave it, Minister Ibrahim Patel, thank you so much for speaking with us.